Old Radio Listening Society, a podcast dedicated to suspense, crime, and horror stories from the golden age of radio. I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. We love mysterious old-time radio stories, but do they stand the test of time? That's what we're here to find out. Today, we return to the listener library for an episode of Suspense, recommended by our mysterious listener and Patreon supporter, Mark. Mark writes, I don't know how the hosts of this podcast feel about one-man shows, But I would guess that there are some strong opinions on the subject. Could you please do an episode on The Waxwork? It was adapted three times for suspense, and each one was produced as a one-man show. The first in 1947, starring Claude Rains, has unfortunately been lost to time. The 1959 production features Herbert Marshall, and the less said about that one, the better. The 1956 adaptation with William Conrad is... Well, I'd really love to hear what the three of you have to say about it. Suspense aired on CBS Radio from 1942 to 1962, producing 947 episodes in total, most of which still exist today. Hailed as radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense specialized in edge-of-your-seat thrillers, some written especially for radio, others adapted from contemporary and classic literature. The Wax Work is based on the 1931 short story by British writer A.M. Burridge. In his lifetime, Burridge was known for his young adult fiction, published under the pseudonym Frank Leland. Today, he is best remembered for his ghost stories, including one of my personal favorites, Smee. In addition to three suspense productions, The Waxwork was also featured on Sleep No More in 1957, Beyond Midnight in 1969, and The Price of Fear in 1973. The story made the transition to television on Lights Out in 1950, and Alfred Hitchcock Presents in 1959, before returning to the audio medium in 2010 for the BBC radio series, The Late Alfred Hitchcock Presents. And now let's listen to The Waxwork from Suspense, starring the one and only William Conrad, first broadcast May 1st, 1956. It's late at night, and a chill has set in. You're alone, and the only light you see is coming from an antique radio. Listen to the sounds coming from the speaker, listen to the music, and listen to the voices. And now, tonight's presentation of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. This evening, Suspense brings you what we feel is a particularly unusual and absorbing story, No actors other than Mr. William Conrad will appear in its presentation. It's a study in terror which has few equals. So now, starring Mr. Conrad, here is tonight's suspense play by A. M. Burridge, The Waxwork. While the uniformed attendants of Mariner's Waxworks were ushering the last stragglers through the great glass panel double doors. The manager sat in his office interviewing Raymond Hewson. The manager was speaking. Oh, there's nothing new in your request, sir. And in fact, we refuse it to different people, mostly young bloods who've tried to make bets about three times a week, I should say. We have nothing to gain and something to lose by letting people spend the night in our murderer's den. If I allowed it and some young idiot lost his senses, what would be my position, eh? But uh, your being a journalist somewhat alters the case. Houston smiled. I, I suppose you mean that journalists have no senses to lose. No, 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 of course not. But one imagines them to be responsible people. Uh, besides, we have something to gain here. Publicity and advertisement. Yes, exactly, said Houston. Uh, and there I thought we might come to terms. The manager smiled. Yes, I know what's coming. You want to be paid twice, do you? You know, it used to be said years ago that Madame Tussaud would give a man a hundred pounds for sleeping alone in the Chamber of Horrors. 
Well, I hope you don't think that we've made any such offer. Uh, what is your paper, Mr. Houston? Well, I, I, I'm freelancing at present, sir, <laughs> working on space for several papers. However, I, I, I would find no difficulty in getting the story printed. I'm sure the Morning Echo would use it like a shot. A night with Mariner's murderers? <laughs> no live paper could turn it down, sir. Yes. Uh, how do you propose to treat it? Well, I shall make it gruesome, of course. Gruesome with just a saving touch of humor. <laughs> The manager nodded and offered Houston his cigarette case. Very well, Mr. Houston. You get your story printed in the morning echo, and there'll be a five-pound note waiting for you when you care to come and call for it. But, uh, first of all, you realize it's no small ordeal that you're proposing to undertake. I'd like to be quite sure about you. I'd like you to be quite sure about yourself. I own I shouldn't care to take it on. I should hate having to sleep down there alone. Among them. Why? Asked Houston. Oh, I don't know. Isn't any reason, I suppose. I don't believe in ghosts. If I did, I should expect them to haunt the scene of their crimes or the spots where their bodies were laid instead of a cellar which happens to contain their waxwork images. Well, it's just that I couldn't sit alone among them all night with their seeming to stare at me in the way they do. After all... They represent the lowest and the most appalling types of humanity. Well, the whole atmosphere of the place is unpleasant. And if you're susceptible to atmosphere, sir, I warn you that you're in for a very uncomfortable night. Houston had known that from the moment when the idea first occurred to him. His soul sickened at the prospect. But he had a wife and a family to keep. So here was a chance not to be missed. The price of a special story in the morning echo with a five-pound note to add to it. Besides, if he wrote the story well, it might lead to an offer of regular employment. The manager smiled at him and rose. Well, I think the last of the people must have gone by now. Oh, uh, there is one condition I'm afraid I must impose upon you, sir. I must ask you not to smoke. We had a fire scare down in the murderer's den this evening. I don't know who gave the alarm, but uh, whoever it was, it was a false one. Fortunately, there were very few people down there at the time, or there might have been a panic. Ah, now, if you're ready, we'll make a move. He led the way through an open barrier and down ill-lit stone stairs, which conveyed a sinister impression of giving access to a dungeon. In a passage at the bottom were a few preliminary horrors, such as relics of the Inquisition, a rack taken from a medieval castle, branding irons, thumb screws, and other mementos of man's cruelty to men. Beyond the passage was the murderer's den. It was a room of irregular shape with a vaulted roof and dimly lit by electric lights burning behind inverted bowls of frosted glass. It was, by design, an eerie and uncomfortable chamber, a chamber whose atmosphere invited its visitors to speak in whispers. The waxwork murderers stood on low pedestals with numbered tickets at their feet. Recent notorieties rubbed dusty shoulders with the old favorites. Thurtell, the murderer of Weir, stood as if frozen in the act of making a shop window gesture to young Bywaters. And there was Lefroy, the poor half-baked little snob who killed for gain so that he might ape the gentleman. Within five yards of him sat Mrs. Thompson, that erotic romanticist hanged to propitiate British middle-class matronhood. Charles Peace, the only member of the vile company who looked uncompromisingly and entirely evil, sneered across a gangway at Norman Thorne. Brown and Kennedy, the two most recent additions, stood between Mrs. Dyer and Patrick Mayen. The manager walking around with Houston pointed out several of the more interesting of these unholy notabilities. 
Uh, that's Crippen. I expect you recognize him, insignificant little beast who looks as if he couldn't tread on a worm. Oh, and that's Armstrong. But looks like a decent, harmless country gentleman, doesn't he? And there's old Vaquier. You can't miss him, of course, because of his beard. And this one... Who's that? Houston asked in a whisper. Here, come here, have a good look at him. Uh, this is our star turn. He's the only one of the bunch that hasn't been hanged. The figure which Houston had indicated was that of a small, slight man. Not much more than five feet in height. It wore little waxed mustaches, large spectacles, and a caped coat. There was something so exaggeratedly French in its appearance that it reminded Houston of a stage caricature. He could not have said precisely why the mild-looking face seemed to him so repellent, but he had already recoiled a step, and even in the manager's company it cost him an effort to look again. But who is he? he asked. That, said the manager, is Dr. Baudet. Houston shook his head doubtfully. I, I think I've heard the name, but I forget in connection with what. The manager smiled. Uh, you'd remember better if you were a Frenchman. You know, for some long while, that man was the terror of Paris. He carried on his work of healing by day and of throat cutting by night. Why, he killed for the sheer devilish pleasure it gave him to kill, and always in the same way, with a razor. After his last crime, he left a clue behind him which set the police upon his track. Oh, but he was much too clever for them. When he realized that the coils were closing about him, he mysteriously disappeared. And ever since, the police of every civilized country have been looking for him. There's no doubt that he managed to make away with himself, and by some means which has prevented his body coming to light, uh, one or two crimes of a similar nature have taken place since his disappearance, but he is believed almost for certain to be dead, and the experts believe these recrudescences to be the work of an imitator. It's queer, isn't it, Mr. Houston? How every notorious murderer has imitators. Houston shuddered and fidgeted with his feet. I, I, I don't like him at all. What eyes he's got. Yes, this figure's a little masterpiece. You find the eyes bite into you, huh? Well, that's excellent realism, then, for Baudet practiced mesmerism and was supposed to mesmerize his victims before dispatching them. Indeed, had he not done so, it's impossible to see how so small a man could have done his ghastly work. There were never any signs of struggle. I... I, I, I thought I saw him move, said Houston with a catch in his voice. The manager smiled. You'll have more than one optical illusion before the night's out, I expect, sir. Well, I'm sorry I can't give you any more light because all the lights are on. For obvious reasons, we keep this place as gloomy as possible, then. Eh? Well, Mr. Houston, good night. Houston wheeled a swivel chair a heavy one upholstered in plush a little way down the central gangway and deliberately turned it so that its back was toward the effigy of Dr. Baudet. For some undefined reason, he liked Dr. Baudet a great deal less than his companions. Busying himself with arranging the chair, he was almost lighthearted. But when the manager's footfalls had died away and a deep hush stole over the chamber... He realized that he had no slight ordeal before him. The dim, unwavering light fell on the rows of figures which were so uncannily like human beings that the silence and the stillness seemed unnatural and even ghastly. He missed the sound of breathing, the rustling of clothes, the 101 minute noises one hears when even the deepest silence has fallen upon a crowd. And the air was as stagnant as water at the bottom of a standing pond. It must be like this at the bottom of the sea, he thought. 
He faced these sinister figures boldly enough. They were only waxworks. So long as he let that thought dominate all others, he promised himself that all would be well. It did not, however, save him long from the discomfort occasioned by the waxen stare of Dr. Baudet, which he knew was directed upon him from behind. The eyes of the little Frenchman haunted and tormented him, and he itched with a desire to turn and look. My nerves have started already, he thought. And then another voice in his brain spoke to him. It's because you're afraid that you won't turn and look at him. The two voices quarreled silently for a moment or two. And at last, Hewson slewed his chair around a little and looked behind him. Among the many figures standing in stiff, unnatural poses, the effigy of the dreadful little doctor stood out with a queer prominence, perhaps because of a steady beam of light beat straight down upon it. Hewson flinched before the parody of mildness which some fiendishly skilled craftsman had managed to convey in wax, met the eyes for one agonized second and then turned again to face the other direction. He's only a waxwork like the rest of you, Yosen muttered defiantly. You're all only waxworks. They were only waxworks, yes. But waxworks don't move. Oh, not that he had seen the least movement anywhere, but it struck him that in the moment or two while he'd looked behind him, there had been the least subtle change in the grouping of the figures in front. Crippen, for instance, seemed to have turned at least one degree to the left. Or, thought Hewson, perhaps the illusion was due to the fact that he had not slewed his chair back into its exact original position. Oh, but there were Brown and Kennedy, too. Surely one of them had moved his hands. Hewson held his breath for a moment and then drew his courage back to him as a man lifts a weight. He took a notebook from his pocket and wrote quickly, Memo, deathly silence and unearthly stillness of figures. Like being at bottom of sea. Hypnotic eyes, Dr. Baudet. Figures seem to move when not being watched. He closed the book suddenly over his fingers and looked round quickly and awfully over his right shoulder. He had neither seen nor heard a movement, but... It was as if some sixth sense had made him aware of one. He looked straight into the vapid countenance of Lefroy, which smiled vacantly back as if to say, It wasn't I. (laughs) No, of course, it wasn't he or any of them. (laughs) It was his own nerves. Or was it? Then why all that silent unrest about him? A subtle something in the air which did not quite break the silence and happened whichever way he looked just beyond the boundaries of his vision. He swung round quickly to encounter the mild but baleful stare of Dr. Baudet and then without warning he jerked his head back to stare straight at Crippen. (laughs) He'd nearly caught Crippen that time. You'd better be careful, Crippen, and all the rest of you. If I do see one of you move, I'll smash you to pieces. Do you hear He ought to go, he told himself. Already he had experienced enough to write his story, or ten stories for the matter of that. Well then, why not go? The morning echo would be none the wiser as to how long he'd stayed. Nobody would care so long as his story was a good one. Yes, but the manager, one never knew. Perhaps the manager would quibble over that five-pound note which he needed so badly. He wondered if his wife were asleep or if she were lying awake and thinking of him. (laughs) She'd laugh when he told her that he'd imagine... that he'd imagine... This was a little too much. 
It was bad enough that the waxwork effigies of murderers should move when they weren't being watched, but it was intolerable that they should breathe. Somebody was breathing. Or was it his own breath which sounded to him as if it came from a distance? He sat rigid, listening, straining, until he exhaled with a long sigh. <laughs> his own breath, after all. Or, uh, if not, something had divined that he was listening and had ceased breathing simultaneously. Hewson turned his head swiftly around and looked all about him out of haggard and hunted eyes. Everywhere his gaze encountered the vacant waxen faces, and everywhere he felt that by just some least fraction of a second he had missed seeing a movement of hand or foot, a silent opening, a compression of lips, a flicker of eyelids, a look of human intelligence now smoothed out. They, they were like naughty children in a classroom, whispering, fidgeting, and laughing behind their teacher's back, but blandly innocent when his gaze was turned upon them. No. No, this would not do. This distinctly would not do. He must clutch at something, grip with his mind upon something which belonged essentially to the workaday world, to the daylight London streets. He was Raymond Hewson, an unsuccessful journalist, a living and breathing man, and these figures grouped around him were only dummies, so they could neither move nor whisper. Well, what did it matter if they were supposed to be lifelike effigies of murderers? They were only made of wax and sawdust and stood there for the entertainment of morbid sightseers and orange-sucking trippers. Oh, that was better. Now, what was that funny story which somebody had told him in the Falstaff pub yesterday? Oh, yes. <laughs> you recall part of it, but not all. For the gaze of Dr. Baudet urged, challenged, and finally compelled him to turn. Hewson half turned and then swung his chair so as to bring him face to face with a wearer of those dreadful hypnotic eyes. His own eyes were dilated, and his mouth at first set in a grin of terror, lifted at the corners in a snarl, and then Hewson spoke and woke a hundred sinister echoes. You moved! <laughs> yes, you did, you moved! I saw you! You moved! Then he sat quite still, staring straight before him, like a man found frozen in the Arctic snows. Dr. Baudet's movements were leisurely. He stepped off his pedestal with the mincing care of a lady alighting from a bus. The platform stood about two feet from the ground, and above the edge of it a plush-covered rope hung in arc-like curves. Dr. Baudet lifted up the rope until it formed an arch for him to pass under, stepped off the platform and sat down on the edge, facing Houston. Then he nodded and smiled and said, Good evening. <laughs> I need hardly tell you that uh, not until I overheard the conversation between you and the worthy manager of this establishment did I suspect that I should have the pleasure of a companion here for the night. <laughs> Or you cannot move or speak without my bidding. But you can hear me perfectly well. Oh, oh something tells me that you are, uh, shall I say, nervous. My dear sir, I have no illusions. I am not one of these contemptible effigies miraculously come to life. I am Dr. Bourdet himself. He paused, coughed, and shifted his legs. Uh, uh, pardon me, but I am a little stiff. Oh, uh, please, let me explain. Uh, circumstances with which I need not fatigue you. 
have made it desirable that I should live in England. I was close to this building this evening when I saw a policeman regarding me, I thought a little too curiously. I guessed that he intended to follow and perhaps ask me embarrassing questions, so I mingled with the crowd and came in here. <laughs> a coin bought my admission to the chamber in which we now meet, and an inspiration showed me a certain means of escape. I raised a cry of fire, <laughs> and when all the fools had rushed to the stairs, I stripped my effigy of the caped coat which you behold me wearing, donned it, hid my effigy under the platform at the back, and took its place on the pedestal. <laughs> uh, the manager's description of me, which I had the embarrassment of being compelled to overhear, was biased, but not altogether inaccurate. Clearly, I am not dead. <laughs> Although it is as well that they will think otherwise, no? His uh, account of my abbey, which I have indulged for years, although through necessity uh, less frequently of late, was in the main true. For you see, the world is divided between collectors and non-collectors. With the non-collectors we are not concerned, eh? The collectors collect anything according to their individual tastes, from money to cigarette cards, from malls to matchboxes. Uh, I collect throats. He paused again and regarded Hewson's throat with interest, mingled with disfavor. Uh, I am obliged to the chance which brought us together tonight, and perhaps it would seem ungrateful to complain. <laughs> Uh, from motives of personal safety, my activities have been somewhat curtailed of late years, and I am glad of this opportunity of gratifying my somewhat unusual whim. But uh, you, sir, you have such a skinny neck. Uh, if you will overlook a personal remark, I should never have selected you from choice. I like men with thick necks. Thick red necks. He fumbled in an inside pocket and took out something which he tested against a wet forefinger and then proceeded to pass gently to and fro across the palm of his left hand. This is a little French razor. The blade, you will observe, is very narrow. They do not cut very deep, but deep enough. In just one little moment, you shall see for yourself. Huh? And now, I shall ask you the little civil question of all the polite barbers... <laughs> Does the razor suit you, sir? He rose up, a diminutive but menacing figure of evil, and approached Houston with a silent, furtive step of a hunting panther. Uh, you will have the goodness to raise your chin a little, then. Eh? Oh, thank you. And a little more, just a little more. Eh? Ah, thank you. Merci, monsieur. Merci, merci. Ah... Over one end of the chamber was a thick skylight of frosted glass which by day let in a few sickly and filtered rays from the floor above. After sunrise, these began to mingle with the subdued light from the electric bulbs. And this mingled illumination added a certain ghastliness to a scene which needed no additional touch of horror. The waxwork figures stood apathetically in their places, waiting to be admired or execrated by the crowds who would presently wander fearfully among them, in their midst, in the center gangway, Hewson sat still, leaning far back in his swivel chair. His chin was uptilted as if he were waiting to receive attention from a barber. And although there was not a scratch upon his throat, nor anywhere upon his body, he was cold and dead. Dr. Baudet on his pedestal, watched the dead man, unemotionally. He did not move, nor was he capable of motion. 
But then, after all, he was only a waxwork. Suspense. In which William Conrad starred in tonight's presentation of The Waxwork. The music for tonight's program was composed by Lucian Morawieck. Next week, we bring you a story based on fact. A man's last hours in a death cell awaiting execution. We call it The Phones Die First. That's next week on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed in Hollywood by Anthony Ellis. Tonight's story was written by A.M. Burridge. The orchestra was conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Stay tuned for five minutes of CBS News to be followed on most of these same stations by My Son Jeep. America listens most to the CBS Radio Network. That was The Waxwork from Suspense here on the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society podcast. Once again, I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. I'll start with this. Mark says, I don't know how you feel about one-man shows. I just want to throw this out here. And, and we are a theater company as well that does audio drama, live on stage together. But this has always been a dream of mine, and I'll never do it, and I don't know how I do it. But to stand on a stage some night with an audience and do all the voices and all the Foley by myself. I just want to try that, you know, like... <laughs> it's a one man show and <laughs> and then I'd put symbols between my knees and everything you know <laughs> but uh so I'm fascinated by the multi-purpose actor one man show thing I think it's really fascinating I will then also say this that uh having listened to this I definitely now will never do it because the bar's too high, <laughs> way too high. Um, it turns out I'm a talentless hack. Oh, good <laughs> lord! Because <laughs> that was gorgeous, top to bottom. I cannot wait to discuss this. There's, let's just tell me, is there a nitpick coming? N- not really. I have some. Or did you hate it? No, no, I really enjoyed it. the The decision to make it a one man show particularly given the story, I think that really is engaging and interesting. But that being the case, it makes me wonder, like, would it have been beneficial to actually have someone else for the manager role? Not because William Conrad couldn't do it or wasn't interesting, Mm -hmm. but just to delineate if the question is, is this, what is that French killer's name? I'm going to call him Baudelaire. It's not Uh, Baudelaire. Doctor. (laughs) Doctor. Dr. Baudet. Baudet, thank you. Yes. Uh, if and Baudet- not Baudet. Don't pronounce it wrong. <laughs> Dr. Baudet is a whole other website you don't want to go to. <laughs> what a refreshing performance. <laughs> <laughs> Came to life. Uh, if that was a product of his imagination, then does that mean the manager was a product of his imagination? Oh, that so you are connecting the decision to perform it as a one-man show with the implications of the narrative at the end. Yes. Gotcha. The possibility of that connection being there makes me question the decision to have the manager be the same actor, which is so minute and dumb. And I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. I tried following what you're saying, and I don't... What are you mad about? <laughs> like, try me again. Come on, bring it again. You know how when we do plays? Yes. And at the very start, there's the table read portion, and we sit around, and I'm sorry for, for all my wonderful other theater friends, but occasionally this table read, is, it's a fascinating dig into the script right. and getting these ideas, and sometimes it's sitting around talking too much. Right. <laughs> this uh, is me sitting around talking too much. So the play sort of walks the line of, did this man happen to stumble upon this French serial killer on the one night he happened to be in a wax museum, right, and it frightened him to death because the the doctor Bidet, uh, that's fine, right. Bidet, um <laughs> likes big necks and he cannot lie, so he did not like his <laughs> his neck. Um, 
Or did this guy just terrify himself to the extent that he completely hallucinated this guy right. and died of fright? Now, if it is that latter, then there is a sort of narrative purpose to him being the voice of both characters. Uh-huh. But if that is the connection, like we want to have him be the voice of both characters to imply that he is both characters, but he's not the manager as well. Right. I got gotcha. you. That's a lot of work for not much. And I, I mean, I enjoyed this episode so much, I feel bad for like starting out in the weeds. You shouldn't. I found that fascinating. <laughs> you all know I don't really listen more than once. And you guys will listen like 90 times and read the novel. I did read the story. We can, we can put a pin in that for now. How much is this literally, like, this seems in a very interesting space between performance and recitation. It's very close to the story. However, I found it interesting that the story is simpler in its prose and in the hmm. metaphors and similes. Oh. And if I were to put on my nerd glasses like Tim just did, I would say that some of that was to compensate for the lack of sound effects, to make hmm. the oh. language a little more descriptive. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some lines that are lifted straight from the story for sure, but I listened to this first, then went back and read the story, and some of my favorite descriptions from the radio adaptation were not there. So the first time I listened to this, I got about halfway through, I think I fell asleep, right? They, oh, I got to go back and listen to that, that suspense. Oh, I thought I was going to be okay. And I'm like, oh, okay, and it starts, and I went, wait a minute, what do you mean William Conrad's all the voices? <laughs> I had made it halfway through the first time and missed that introduction where he said, starring William Conrad as everybody. I didn't hear that. Hmm. So when I heard that, I went, that can't be. It's kind of like listening to um, Mel Blanc in the Looney Tunes cartoons. And you're like, no, there's no way that's all one guy. And then I listened the second time just in awe. Like the journalist is crazy. His voice is uh, whatever that is. is so... That's really not William Conrad. It's yeah. really not yeah. him. And the, the French uh, doctor uh, toilet thing. <laughs> Dr. Ballet. Dr. <laughs> Ballet. <laughs> Dr. Bidet uh, yeah. is a crazy good voice. Uh, it's It was fascinating. So performance-wise, in addition... Oh, there's so much I want to say. In addition, I think the writing of this, I really like it. You take that performance and it pushes it way out of the stratosphere. Anybody else doing this, you'd be like, that was pretty good or that's good writing. This performance makes it just something completely else. Mm -hmm. Crazy good. Well, it's essentially an audiobook. Yes. Because there are no sound effects in here. Right. And the best audiobooks are this perfect match between content and reader. And I think... That's what Eric is getting at, that right. this is just this ideal combination of story, different characters for Conrad to play that show off his versatility. Mm -hmm. But then also back to my point about the sound effects is that I made it through this completely without realizing there were no sound effects and mm -hmm. was convinced there were. So then I went back, wait, there were sound effects. I heard when he got out his notebook and was writing the notes with his pencil, there were yeah. little pencil scratch marks. So I go back and listen. No. No, there wasn't. When he turned his chair around to face he, different when guys. When he mentions the squeak, yeah. I assume there's a, yeah. I hear the squeak. I'll take it a step further. I didn't recognize that there were no sound effects till you just said it. Wow. It did not occur to me until just now, oh my God, you're right. There were no sound effects in this. Wow. I think you're lying. <laughs> I think no, I kept going back and rewinding and listening very closely. But wow. I was convinced yeah, me too. My favorite thing about this is the rhythm of the story. Because that period of time where he's just flipping out and thinking he's seeing things and doesn't want to turn, I was convinced, like, and I'm going to have like 20 minutes of this, and there'll be some shocking ending, and that'll be the story. And when the, the story finally decides, and then one of the guys just steps out and starts talking. <laughs> it took me by such complete surprise. Right. Such a tone difference, but still terrifying and weird and that's what struck me that tone shift this desperate fearful bellow almost mm, peter yeah. laurie esque in its grandness of like you move you move mm -hmm. to this beat and it's not just the quietness of describing the 
murderer stepping off the pedestal, but it's the language they chose. One of my favorite lines is, he stepped off his pedestal with the mincing care of a lady alighting from a bus. Right. That is not how you should describe someone who you want your listener to be terrified of. But that description is terrifying in that moment because of its incongruity. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a ton of that in the writing in here. Um, he's frozen like a, I can't remember what it is, a man. Popsicle. A popsicle. No, a bit better. It. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they keep revisiting that underwater sort of. The underwater thing, but he, they're frozen like a man found frozen. In the, I found it in my notes. Found frozen <laughs> in the Arctic snows. Made me think of... Uh, a study in wax, a different wax theme right. William Conrad yeah. episode. We like anything with the word wax in it. Yes. <laughs> Two things on what was just said. One, I want to emphasize more of the scream. That moment of performance of you moved, you moved. Oh my God, it's unearthly, that performance of that. It's terrifying. It's gripping. It pulled me out of my skin when he screams it. Again, 100%, that actor, that performance, that line can be done by any actor in a million different ways. The way he chose and what he did makes this entire experience so much better. That was a moment that is one of my top five radio drama moments of all time. Second thing I want to bring up is about the narrator and the convention being broken as the narrator becomes inner monologue instead of narrator. And it switches back and forth a little bit. There are moments, especially at the top, where it's just a narrator. He said, Mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. He said, and then he went over here and he did that. And this happened and this happened. As it moves on, that narrator is not only in her monologue, the narrator is becoming the journalist freaking out and performance-wise. And normally, I would say that was um, not only risky, but not necessary and probably doomed to fail. The fact that they were switching back and forth on that from narrator to inner monologue and made it work seamlessly is also fascinatingly uh, brilliant. Well, I think it shows that Anthony Ellis, who directed it, well, or maybe it was in the original choice. I don't know if Anthony Ellis was the original director for the first mm-hmm. time they did it or not. It might have been a script choice, but the, to trust the audience because mm-hmm. it, it starts by carefully delineating the narrator with a few he says. Mm hmm. And because it's the same actor and Conrad, I agree with you, he did an amazing job, but Conrad has a very distinctive voice. So you need to be really careful at that top. But then they trust the listener to learn the rules of the story. And so they don't feel the need to over clarify by going, he thought. Right. You're right. And I did. I totally moved from narrator to the journalist speaking to himself alone. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just is beautiful. And the other thing I wanted to say about that scream. Yeah is that I didn't really think about it till it was all over because it's Conrad playing all the characters. It didn't strike me, but that those are his last words Oh yeah, as well. Mm. It kind of went over yeah. my head in the moment because then I got so sucked into what's going to happen and, oh, the waxwork is alive, but he's, it's not a ghost. Right. He's claiming to really be the murderer, which was a nice red herring. So suddenly you feel like it's this supernatural event happening to you and to... Mm-hmm. Of the journalist, and then it pulls you in this other direction. And then at the end, it pulls you in another direction yeah. by saying, or maybe it was. Or maybe his yeah. imagination, or not that, as literal as you believed it to be. That ending is also, I mean, endings to suspense stories are so hard, suspense gets it right so much often, but that description of the light filtering into the skylight yes. and the gloomy place, and it just makes it even worse to have a little bit of sunlight in there. Gorgeous and horrible. It's what it's like to get super drunk at an Applebee's in the middle of the afternoon (laughs) and walk out and go, oh, my God, I'm in a strip mall, and its sun is out. Uh, I speak from experience, and it was terrible. (laughs) I was imagining you at an Applebee's just unconscious with your head back (laughs) at the barbers. (laughs) There's nothing worse than having a good time somewhere and walking outside, and it's bright. I'm like, no, it should be midnight. Oh, it's four o'clock. <laughs> I have, um, I have. I've got to get a yoga. <laughs> I have to stay up. All right. So, the ending. I want to talk about that a little bit. It's ambiguous in the sense of did he frighten himself to death, or is it a ghost that frightened him to death? Right? Or, or did, did he just happen to run into the actual killer? Right. Yeah. And he died of a heart attack before the killer could cut his throat, and he just put his wax figure right, back yeah. in place and walked out the back. So it could be all three. Uh, I really am in love with the idea, though, of 
oh, there's the police. I should run. Oh, I'm going to go into the basement of this place. Hey, there's me. <laughs> How crazy ironic. Oh, this is perfect. <laughs> Thank that you. That is entertaining. Like, all right, I just have to stay here until the night. <laughs> the hell is this guy doing here? <laughs> oh, no. I can't stay still much longer. <laughs> Conrad's performance and the script does such a good job of putting you into that night terror mode, mm -hmm. that half dream state. You're terrified with him in at night in this basement. So all of those considerations like, wow, what are the odds, don't come into a play. It's that half awake state where everything seems plausible. It's terrifying right now, so it must be true. Mm -hmm. And it's not until we join him again at the end and he's dead and there's not a mark on him that all those possibilities and all the different meanings of mm -hmm. what you experienced come through as a listener. Yeah. And I think for me, I think the intent of this production is to make you believe it was all in the journalist's head. I, I would agree with you. I think that the intent was he scared himself to death. It's one line though that, I think puts it over for that interpretation and it is the way Conrad delivers the last merci when he's going merci, mm -hmm. merci and the last one has that physical gesticulation quality uh, with it where he goes merci yeah. and you can just see his arm right. slashing outward with that last thank you and that's why it was so jarring and it cuts to black and I went well he's dead I guess what I'm trying to say is I just was the quintessential sucker for this right. yeah, I was totally on the hook and I went through each manipulative step they wanted me to go through and it's rare in a radio drama yes. where I do that especially because we listen to so many and you right. get in the habit of second guessing them all and I never accurately guessed this one no, no. <laughs> and there was that journey of while the Frenchman uh, Dr. Uh, Bidet is uh, <laughs> starts talking that you are going where is he where is he? Where's the guy? Where's the guy? Where's the guy? Why is the guy not talking? It's mm -hmm. not annoying. It's not like, oh, come on. Did you not write it? There's nothing bad about it other than it's compelling and suspenseful that he's not talking. Who, the journalist? Yeah. Well, he's been hypnotized. Well, is that what it is? Well, they set that up, that idea that he, right, that yeah. he was a mesmerist and that was the only way he could have possibly killed and overpowered his victims because he's so slight. I don't even need that because of the ending, it could be that he died right away yeah. or mm -hmm. he uh, was so scared he couldn't talk or this is all in his head, so why would we hear him talk? Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, yeah. it doesn't need Or I he's just very polite and didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> right. <laughs> I didn't hear the mesmerism part. Uh, believe it or not, six times, listen to this. But it doesn't matter, though, because it's really suspenseful and it's all very fascinating, interesting, really well done and compelling. At the same time, there's a second layer of compelling of where is the other guy? You know, like, why is he not speaking? And you didn't run into that because you knew he was hypnotized. So I had a whole other little fun <laughs> thing going on in my head. Um, I will let's edit agree that with, out. No, I will. <laughs> I will agree with you that I think the story does a really good job hiding all the clues because the clues are there. Mm. It's just really good at that sleight of hand. The mesmerism at the time just seemed like a really interesting detail because they did do a nice trick where the manager from the waxwork went into a lot of detail about all the murderers. Mm -hmm. So when he shares the little detail about the mesmerism of this guy, it doesn't stand out as like, oh, yeah. someone's going to get hypnotized. Yeah. So right. I think it's easy to gloss over because it's buried in a bunch of information that is irrelevant to this right. actual story as it unfolds. So I would not beat yourself up over this. There are plenty of other things on the you right. should beat yourself up list. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Trust me. But on the, on the, my wife on the, has a Google Doc. <laughs> <laughs> Could she share it with me? I just want to add it. On the, on the fire alarm thing, it can be a twist of, is this going to come back into play? Is some element of the plot going to depend on this being the case? And it can be read as all that it matters is that he heard it. Mm -hmm. When he's telling himself the story of how this killer got in here, like, right. oh, there was a fire alarm. I know that. Or the killer was running down the street from a cop and went into a waxwork and found, <laughs> oh, my God, that's me. I still love that. I, all three of them are fine. I love all three <laughs> endings, whatever it is. But that one uh, has a very Mission Impossible kind oh, of yeah. feel to it. <laughs> As I was listening to this, um, 
I was enjoying it. It sounds like I was thinking of something just related. It makes it sound like I wasn't really listening to the story, but I was thinking of Uncanny Valley and why Waxworks mm-hmm. both are sort of disturbing to look at, but also, for the most part, you would never mistake one for a person. Right. Have you ever been in one? Yes. Mm-hmm. I have not. Nor do I have any desire. I think it would freak me out. I think it's weird. They're not that terrifying, considering that it is such a staple of horror. Because, like Tim said, they're just so far from being realistic. Um, yeah. It's more just depressing and weird, which I enjoy. It's also- just my, my personality. <laughs> but it also, it, it, I then understand why, if you were to see a real person among these wax figures... You'd know. But to, to take him for a wax, it'd be really upsetting, disturbing. Like, that is unnaturally real. I think the idea of the wax museums, the, the celebration of the world's most horrible people also sits wrong with me. They're, they are forever remembered in this museum. It is like there's Hall of Presidents and people who kill people. Right. Yeah, and they're easily confused, really. <laughs> no, that's the same thing. <laughs> no. I think Zachary Taylor's in both. <laughs> I also believe that uh, most criminals should never have their name. Uh, you should never hear their name, I, especially serial killers. I, I don't want to celebrate them. I don't want to know their name. I don't want to give them what essentially is part of the desire, yeah. is to be well known. And so I hate that idea about the wax museum. I think museum. hard work should be rewarded. Yes. <laughs> I think there should be a wax museum of really 250 podcast episodes <laughs> <laughs> with like... A hundred listeners? You guys are... you. <laughs> I'll pay you five pounds to spend the night at the Wax Museum of Podcasters. <laughs> Listen to them just talk and talk oh, and talk. Oh. Any other thoughts oh, on this? So His many. body was so found many. in the morning. <laughs> found in the Arctic. Born to death. Right. <laughs> um... It's a terrifying idea, and it has been popularized today. I, I know you guys always scoff at me when I bring up Doctor Who, but this is new Doctor Who, so scoff. it's actually <laughs> it's actually really well known. But basically, they use uh, the Weeping Angels idea in here, or the Weeping Angels used this horror idea. Oh, and, totally. But the idea that um, he had to keep looking at the statues, because if he stopped looking at them, they would move. And, had, and he keeps moving his chair around and trying to decide who he wants to look at to keep from moving as he's starting to get really a little scare crazy. Right, right. Weeping angels? It's an alien in Doctor Who that um, can't move while you're looking at them. And so if you even blink... Anytime you see them, they look like angel statues. Oh. So So if you blink or look away, then the next time you look at them, they've moved probably closer. That's a great little thing. That's uh, that's terrifying. terrifying. (laughs) Yeah. It's the only good idea in new Doctor Who. <laughs> but I'll save that for my Doctor, Doctor Who, Who podcast. podcast. <laughs> yes. I had one other line I wanted to recognize because it's not from the original story, and I thought it was fantastic. Um, if you are susceptible to atmosphere, sir, I warn you, you're in for a very uncomfortable night. It's not so much that that's this excellent line, but I realized that that phrase, susceptible to atmosphere, is really like, the perfect simple way to describe why I love old time radio. Right. <laughs> right. And particularly suspense and horror genre. It mm-hmm. is all about creating this tone or mood. Yeah. It is theater of the mood. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that just really popped out at me. And then when I went back and read it, I went, that line's not in there. And to go back to what we were saying earlier, it has nothing to do with the music and there are no sound effects. I mean, the music's fine. It didn't bother me. It wasn't, X minus one or anything in it, but it was, you know, it was, but it didn't need it and it didn't have any sound effects and they created this mood. That's crazy. That's crazy. Can we vote? Mm -hmm. Yes. The voice work alone, that talent level to be able to pull that off. I have never, well, I have Mel Blanc, um, (laughs) uh, Paul Uh, Mm Freeze. I mean, there's a number of people, but that's, I didn't expect that from uh, Canon. I just didn't expect it from, <laughs> sorry, I know he's done a lot more. I didn't expect that from Conrad to have that range. And the story is really good, and it's really well written, and the timing and the pacing and everything about this, this is a classic. This is one of the best things I've ever listened to. 
period. It's just fantastic. That was really amazing top to bottom. Well, I'm really glad you said that because one of the things from uh, Mark's email that I did not include at the top was that he said if he had one quibble with the podcast is that we don't give William Conrad enough love. Uh So there you go, Mark. (laughs) Eric just gave William Conrad, you know, about as much love as you can give without it getting weird. (laughs) I feel bad that we have not shown enough love to, to William Conrad or that someone might doubt our affection. Well, you should stop over sometime, Mark, when I'm listening to Gunsmoke. And, uh, now it's weird. Yeah. Now it's weird. <laughs> I love him in Gunsmoke. Yeah, this is a classic. It's um, And even among... Sometimes you talk about is just a classic of suspense or, or is it an outlier. This is a little bit of an outlier for all the... the technical production elements we talked about um that this is not the usual way they do things right i'm sitting here thinking an interesting parallel between our this and our ongoing listening of signal man that the there was a really great version of signal man in 1956 and a really bad one in 1959 so i think it might not necessarily be the actor who was uh no it probably was the actor too anyways 1959 suspense they redid a lot of stuff and not nearly as good that's uh what year was this again this was 56. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's straight toward the the beginning of the end. Yeah, but it's clearly still really good. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, this is when they're redoing stuff, but they can get first-rate talent to redo it. Right, before they ran out of money. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, they paid William Conrad all the money. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why it was a one-person show. We got enough to pay you and nobody else. <laughs> Look, I'm going to bring in a whole troop of actors here. <laughs> get in there, get in there, Conrad. Start reading. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is fantastic, amazing, uh, both performance and story. Yeah, I definitely call it a classic. I mean, I don't think we mentioned it earlier, but part of what made it fantastic was they picked the right story for a one-person show, too. And yes. I mean, we yes. raved it's about a, isolation. It's yeah. about isolation, yes, but it's also incredibly simple. Mm-hmm. It's not incredibly simple. It's very detailed, and it's structured really well, but it's Elegant guy right? in a chair. Yeah, yeah. but it, <laughs> right. they knew to not pick something really complicated. You couldn't do like House in Cypress Canyon as a one man show. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> another beautiful horror well, story. I guess but... that's a puppet I have to put back in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna... Puppet blood coming out from under the closet. <laughs> wow! I was going to say challenge accepted <laughs> when I do that one man show finally without you two uh-huh. dragging me down. <laughs> I'm doing House in Cypress Canyon. Uh, I should never have given a concrete example for that uh, <laughs> point. <laughs> Points are always more believable without examples to disprove. But uh, I think it still somewhat stands that point, that this was a really well-chosen story uh, mm-hmm. for this. And yes, it's technically just an audiobook. And I don't mean to be dismissive of that, but I think it's fair because we are an old-time radio podcast, which means we think there's something magical about that combination of actors and sound effects and music. Mm -hmm. And there's a part of me that says, well, we shouldn't be this enthusiastic about something that takes half of that away. (laughs) But I think what some of my enthusiasm for this is how it manages to capture that immersive, imagination-provoking quality that I associate with dramatic radio and why right. I like it so much with half the tools. So awesome. Classic. Thank you, Mark. Yes. Thank you, Mark. He moved. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, tell him stuff. Please go visit ghoulish delights.com home of this podcast. You'll find other po- episodes there. Um, other episodes of suspense and a bunch of other stuff. Um, we did a lot of episodes. This is like 260 some episodes. No, 247. We've done a lot of episodes. I've I've given this speech so many times. I'm so tired. <laughs> He's falling asleep giving it. <laughs> you will also find links to our social media pages. You can comment on episodes, vote in polls, let us know what you thought. You can tell us how much you love William Conrad. Get weird. <laughs> <laughs> And you can also link to our Patreon page. Yes, become a Patreon and support this podcast just like Mark does. And um, by supporting this podcast, it is not just financial support, although that is pretty much the base level. you got to give us money. (laughs) (laughs) But built upon that foundation of giving us money is also a sense of community. (laughs) Right. Oh, I tried it, and my, all sincerity left my body, but I really do mean it sincerely that um, joining Patreon is a, a lot of 
fun because we hang out and I, I am having a lot of fun. We have Zoom happy hours. I do a Zoom book club. Mark's we, coming over to listen to some gun smoke. <laughs> <laughs> Anything can happen when you join Patreon. So check it out and um, please support us financially. <laughs> And as you, uh, we've alluded to in this podcast, we do live stage reproductions of classic old time radio shows and a lot of our own original work. Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society Theater Group, uh, which is us and the talented Shannon Custer, we perform monthly and we would uh, love to see you and get a ticket. You can come see us. Uh, perform live or you can get a ticket and watch it online you can be anywhere in the world uh, every month we do uh, either original work of uh, audio theater or a recreation to get that to find out where we are this month and every month uh, you know unless it's you know it's 2085 and you're <laughs> listening to this on the internet <laughs> well you know what I'll still be doing that one man show <laughs> of House in Cypress Canyon uh, go to ghoulishdelights.com or mysteriousoldradiolisteningsociety.com and you can find out where we're going to be and anybody can see us. All right. What's anybody. Anybody. Yeah. yeah we have so many different ways you can give us money. We are yeah. really generous like that. You know what else we, we just started? We started a thing called, just send us a check. <laughs> <laughs> Special program. You don't get anything. You send us a check. You don't get a show. You don't get any kind of hoo-ha. Send, you know, and... Eric Webster. No. That's who you make it out to. <laughs> if you I'll want make some sure hoo-ha, they... we can, for a little check, we can do some hoo-ha. <laughs> <laughs> Come over and watch Gunsmoke. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm going to have to edit that out because you're going to start getting requests. <laughs> People are going to show up on your doorstep. <laughs> Let's find out how much money they have before we uh, say no. Uh, seriously, to come in my house and uh, listen or watch Gunsmoke with me, uh, it's not going to be too much out of my... Uh, uh, Hundred bucks. Hundred bucks. Dollar <laughs> seventy-five. <laughs> what is coming up next? Oh, that's me. Hey, uh, we're going to listen to an episode of Up for Parole, the case of Clarence Hogan. Until then. There's a place where people smile big, eat good, and always score a sweet deal. It's got to be Applebee's. Oh, it's four o'clock. <laughs>